All right. Um, I think we can go ahead and get started then. All right, so welcome everyone to another session of the PCE3 seminar series. And I think this is our seminar number 30. So we wanted to thank everyone for continuing to come out and participate in these seminars aimed at better understanding the origins of life. And today we're lucky to have two great speakers, uh, Patrick Barth and Bonnie Teese. And we're gonna have a chance for some discussion once both speakers have finished their presentations. So please, if you have any questions or comments, make note of those and save them till the end. And I think we're going to start off with Patrick. Um, and Patrick is currently a project coordinator at the University of Stuttgart, working with the Cluster of Excellence for Data, data Integrated Simulation Science. And Patrick did his PhD work at the University of St. Andrews and the Space Research Institute of the Austrian Academy of Sciences where he studied the effect of lightning on atmospheric chemistry of exoplanets and the early Earth. And in, in addition to his research, Patrick is also passionate about science communication. So we're very happy to have him here to share with us today. So whenever you're ready, go ahead, Patrick. Um, I think you might still be muted, Patrick. If you're... So you should hear me now and see my screen now? Yeah, everything looks great. Great. Okay, so yeah, thank you very much for um, the invitation and the introduction. Um, and I have to talk to you today about uh, some work I did during my PhD. Um, yeah, just so go a bit back, back about my journey. Um, just So I've, um, the work I'm going to present to you about, I've conducted um, during my time at St. Andrews, um, where I did my, the first three years of my PhD. Um, and you can actually see the lab um, here in the background of this picture. So quickly put on the laser pointer. Um, I've then spent the last year of my PhD um, at the Space Research Institute in Graz in Austria, where I also um, have coordinated an exhibition on exoplanet atmospheres, um, which is actually in the US right now. So if you are in New York City right now or in, in Boston in a few weeks, you should go check it out. And um, then in the September, I moved on to the University of Stuttgart in Germany, um, where I'm supporting the um, Cluster of Excellence data integrated simulation science in uh, coordinating the next proposal. So actually more a science management role than a research position. Um, most of the what, yeah, what I'm talking about today um, is published in a paper that we've put out earlier this year. And I want to acknowledge all my courses and collaborators, particularly Eva Stuck and Christiana Helling, my supervisors in St. Andrews and Graz, our undergraduate students in the lab, Lucas and Yusian, Mark also from the University of St. Andrews, and then Wendell Walters from Brown University. Okay, so um, I'll start at the beginning. Like, uh, nitrogen is an important uh, macro, um, building block for macromolecules um, for life, like the nuclear basis of the DNA. And Nitrogen is also abundantly available in the atmosphere, and it has been probably for most of, of all of Earth's history. But the nitrogen in this atmospheric N2 is very stable, and it's just it's not really easy to break this N2 apart and make the nitrogen available for life. Today, there are bacteria in the soil that Basically, their sole purpose is to break apart the N2 molecules and form different um, uh, molecules bearing nitrogen, for example, ammonium, that then can be used by other life forms. And this process of making nitrogen available for life is called nitrogen fixation. But just after the origin of life, these 
um, bacteria haven't been there yet. So we need a different process to break apart the N2 and make it available for life. And for that, you need a high energy input, such as uh, lightning or meteorite impacts. And the questions we were looking at in this um, project were whether lightning can efficiently fix nitrogen in the atmosphere of early Earth, and how we know whether we know whether those uh, whether lightning was actually an important source of nutrients for life on the early Earth. To answer this questions, we performed experiments similar to the original Miller-Urey experiment, which you can see here um, in this diagram. Back um, 50 years ago, when they performed their experiments, Miller-Urey inserted a um, discharge into a reducing gas mixture of methane, ammonia, and hydrogen. And they found that when they let it run for uh, over a week, it uh, um, produced several amino acids and more than 20 amino acids were found. And we conducted very similar experiments in our lab in St. Andrews. However, we used a different atmospheric composition. As we have now know, think that earlier its atmosphere was actually not strongly reducing, but rather a mixture of N2 and CO2. So we conducted experiments with N2 and O2, like mimicking modern Earth's atmosphere and then CO2, similar to early Earth's atmosphere. And what now then is happening is first that the spark, these molecules get dissociated. So we produce free oxygen, free nitrogen, NO, and in case for the early Earth, also CO. These molecules or fragments are then moving out um, of the spark into the surrounding gas where the NO will further oxidize to NO2 and other nitrogen oxides, which will dissolve into the water to form HNO2 and HNO3. These will react with the water to produce uh, the ions nitrite and nitrate. But if we have an acidic solution, um, HNO2 is more stable than nitrite, and eventually everything or most of the nitrogen will end up in nitrate. A nitrate is an, a very important nutrient. Still today, we use it to dung our fields, or even when you just want to grow your plants in the garden, you can use nitrite for this, a nitrate. Okay, so we run this experiment, and I'm now going to show you the results of our nitrogen fixation yields. So on the left y-axis, this is the energy yield, the number of molecules of uh, fixed nitrogen we produced per joule of input energy. And we use this um, unit to compare it because it's easier to compare to reported values in the literature, in particular where it allows us to calculate an annual production um, in teragrams or megatons of fixed nitrogen per year using a modern Earth's flash rate and you get this black um, values, or if you use an estimate on the Achaean flash rate, which might have been a bit smaller, you'd get um, those red, uh, red axes. And I will show you the results for the three different gas compositions we used, um, the Achaean um, N2CO2, the modern N2O2, and then a low O2, which is basically 99% nitrogen with a little bit of oxygen. Um, we grouped the results together into three um, categories. First, the gaseous um, products, so that's NO and NO2 in blue. Then the aqueous products, nitride and nitrate in red. And combined, they give the total amount of fixed nitrogen in black. And when comparing the Achaean to the modern results, you notice that the overall amount of fixed nitrogen is similar in both experiments. At least when you look at the energy yield, once you take into account a lower flash rate, of course, there's a difference. But where you find a difference between those two gas mixtures is in the species um, that are produced. So in the modern gas mixture, most of the nitrogen will end up in the aqueous phase, nitrate and nitrate. 
and only a few percent will remain in the gas phase. But in the Akean gas mixture, we find about the same amount of um, gaseous products as aqueous products. And we believe this is due to the limited amount um, availability of O2 um, in the Akean gas mixture, limiting the oxidation of the NO to NO2. Um, and expectedly, our lower two experiments have much lower yields because there's just much less oxygen in the gas available. If we now compare our results for the modern gas mixture to values reported in the literature from theory, experiments, and field data, we see that our results for the overall amount of fixed nitrogen fits quite well um, into the range of values being reported, which suggests that for this purpose, we can actually use a small spark experiment to um, extrapolate to real lightning. Okay, so now that we know that lightning was uh, efficiently fixing nitrogen or could have fixed efficiently nitrogen in an early Earth atmosphere, now we want to know whether it was an important source of nutrients for the earliest forms of life. And for that, we're using the nitrogen isotopes as a fingerprint. So nitrogen has two isotopes, 14N and 15N, and you can measure their ratio with this delta 15N value. So this is given by the ratio of the heavier 15N to the lighter 14N um, in your sample compared to the standard, which is the N2 in modern um, Earth's atmosphere. And then it's measured in per mil. Now, every reaction um, that is taking place in our flask, um, where you transform nitrogen from one form to another, it will change this delta 15N value because each of the reactions will favor um, either the light or the heavy isotope um, in, with a different intensity. Um, and we can then compare the results from our experiment to samples from the rock record. So people over the last years and decades and went to places um, to look at old rocks from, you can see here, all the way going back to 3.8 billion years ago, and measured the isotopic composition of nitrogen in those samples. And by comparing these um, measured values to our experimental results, we can say something about how the nitrogen ended up in those rocks, or not, how not. So um, these are our results. So on the y-axis, we have the delta 15n value. Zero is here, so that um, modern Earth's N2, um, which is also the old, in the early Earth, uh, the atmospheric N2 uh, had a very similar, uh, like a very similar um, isotopic signature to modern Earth's atmosphere. Um, and on the x-axis, I'm showing you the combined nitrate and nitrite concentration. Combined because we can only measure the, um, the delta 15n value for um, all of the aqueous products. So we couldn't separate between nitrate and nitrite. And what you can see here is that there is a clear trend. The smaller, uh, the more, the larger the concentration of nitrate and nitrite, the smaller the delta 15N value. So the more um, reduced the amount of 15N is compared to 14N. We also conducted a few experiments where we would let, where we would let sit the gas and the water together for a few hours or even overnight to mimic more closely real lightning conditions. So in real lightning conditions in your thundercloud, you'll have loads of small water droplets where your gases can dissolve into. So you have a large surface area. But in our experiment, you just have yeah, a rather small surface area compared to the volume of water and volume of gas. And so by giving it a few more hours to equilibrate, we're trying to more closely compare um, our experiment to real lightning conditions. And what we can see is if we give gas and um, aqueous phase a bit more time to equilibrate, we see even lower delta 15 in values than um, previously. Now to properly analyze these um, 
this data. We now need to use a different x-axis. So on the y-axis, we still have that delta 15n value. But on the x-axis, we now look at the fraction of remaining NO. So we know that all of our nitrogen oxides will first have started with an NO molecule from the spark. So by adding up the concentrations of NO, NO2, NO2 minus, and NO3 minus, we get the amount of the initial nitrogen oxide produced. And we know how much NO is left at the end of the, our experiment. And from this, we can calculate this fraction F. So F equals one means all of the N nitrogen is still in NO. Um, all of the produced, all initially produced NO is still in the form of NO. And a value of zero means that all NO was oxidized to other nitrogen oxides. So if we plot our data, it looks a bit like this. Now you may notice these are fewer data points than before. And this is because to calculate F, we need the concentrations of NO, NO2, NO2 minus, and NO3 minus, and we only had those available for a limited set of data. Um, and you can see that they follow a very close uh, binary trend. You can plot a line to it. This is a red dotted line for a closed system Rayleigh fractionation. A closed system meaning that after your reaction from NO to NO2 and nitride and nitrate, all the reservoirs are still in contact with each other. So you can still have equilibration between the different reservoirs. And when we extrapolate this to where F equals zero, so where all nitrogen oxide is converted into nitrate and nitride, um, we find, get a delta 15n of minus 70 per mil. Um, now let's go step by step to what is actually taking place in all of those steps. So we start with the N2 in the gas phase. And we know this has a delta 15n of zero. Now the first thing that happens is that from this N2, we produce NO in the spark. And um, we can calculate the kinetic isotope fractionation of this reaction by using the mass of the N2 molecules, comparing the N2 with N, um, 14N and 14N and the N2 with 114N and 115N. And um, this gives us um, this delta 15N of minus 17 for the initial NO reservoir. And then, um, the oxidation to NO2 will, uh, has a positive fractionation. So the first NO2 that is produced will be uh, between plus 12 and plus 19 per mole. So by now producing enriched um, NO2, we're reducing the amount of heavy N, like 15N in our NO. So each subsequently produced NO2 will have a slightly lighter composition, so a lower delta 15N, until the last bit of NO2 being produced will have the delta 15N value of the original NO. And then because most of the NO2, nearly all of the NO2, is further um, converted into NO2 minus and NO3 minus, they'll have the same delta 15N value. Now you might wonder whether a thunderstorm cloud can be described as a closed system or if it rather be an open system. Because once your NO or NO2 is dissolved into a water droplet, this water droplet might be lost out of the system by convection and um, will not be in contact with the um, surrounding gas phase anymore. Um, but if we look at this blue line, which is describes an open system fractionation, we see that they are quite similar given our large uncertainties. And they'll, in the end, they'll still end up at the same um, delta 15N value for the initial reservoir. So how does this now compare to the values we find in the literature for, um, for the nitrogen um, sedimentary rock record? 
Um, for this, so we want to compare our values to the experiments with the Achaean gas mixture and this additional equation time going down to around minus 10 to minus 15, or even down to our um, ex uh, extrapolated end number of minus 17 per mil. And if we compare those values to the sedimentary rock record in the early Achaean, we see that most values are much higher, around zero or be positive. This suggests an earlier onset of biological nitrogen fixation as early as 3.8 billion years ago. Um, but there's one value, this pink value, that has been corrected for changes in when the went after it was deposited. And it, the original isotopic uh, composition of this sample might have been as low as minus 10 per mil, and therefore closer to our results, and might suggest a potential lightning contribution to the earliest biosphere. So to conclude, we've seen that nitrogen fixation seems to be equally or similarly efficient in an Archean as in a modern Earth atmosphere, depending on the event and eventually the light, uh, lightning flash rate um, that was present. Um, when we've seen that our spark experiments can be used to simulate or extrapolate for, for real lightning conditions, at least for the purpose of the nitrogen fixation rate. Um, we've seen that our results suggest that most um, of the nitrogen data might have been produced by biological nitrogen fixation rather than by lightning. But we found this one sample that might suggest a lightning contribution. And going forward, these lightning isotopic sig signatures can now be used to investigate nitrogen fixation on other places. For example, nitrate has been found on Mars. And uh, with this, I'm at the end of my talk and happy to take questions. Thank you very much. Great, thank you, Patrick. And as I mentioned at the beginning, we'll yes. have questions at the end. So if you had any questions or comments for Patrick, please hold on to those until we um, have heard from Bonnie. But uh, thanks again, Patrick, and we'll look forward to the discussion. And now we're going to be hearing from Bonnie Thies, who is a postdoctoral fellow at the NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory, where she is developing life detection strategies for the Invader Project in deep ocean hydrothermal vents. And Bonnie received her PhD from the University of New South Wales, Sydney, where she studied organic biosignatures in the geologic record. And she believes that contextual knowledge is essential to biosignature research, so to that end, she spends a lot of her time in the field at locations such as the Pilbara region in Australia and Yellowstone National Park in the USA. And also of note, Bonnie won the Geological Society of Australia's Boise Medal, which is awarded to an early career researcher for significant contributions to earth sciences. So thank you for joining us, Bonnie, and we're excited to hear from you. Thank you. Um, so today I'm going to talk about a lot of research that I've done thinking about organic matter and how it changes through time and how that's relevant to the early Earth. Um, and the way that I approach all of my science is from a perspective of what does this mean for the early Earth? And that includes not just the science I do in the lab, but the science I do when it comes to thinking about improving equity in geoscience education. Um, and doing research on those topics. So if anybody else is interested in how to improve equity in geoscience education or how to educate people about the early earth, um, please contact me. I love to talk about this topic. Um, I just really like very interested in it and would love to talk to more people about it at all times. Um, so without further ado, I'm start talking about the topic that I'm here to talk about. <laughs> um, so I'm now a postdoc at JPL, but most of what I'm going to talk about today is research that I did when I was back in Australia, um, working in the Australian Centre for Astrobiology, where I did my PhD. So 
I'm really an astrobiologist and I like to work on organic biosignatures, so signs of life uh, that are so destructed that it's really hard to recognize what left them there. I think of it like a puzzle and we only have like just a small piece of the puzzle and we have to reconstruct the rest of what's missing. So organic um, molecules compose a lot of different types of signs of life. So what I'm showing on this slide is the ladder of life detection. And this is uh, showing different rungs of how you might look for life. So at the top, you have something that's definitively life like Darwinian evolution, whereas at the bottom, you have something that may be more suspicious or hard to interpret, um, like textural biosignatures. Many of the rungs of the ladder of life detection are molecular. In fact, we can look here that we start right up here at DNA and we go all the way down here to monomeric units of uh, biopolymers. So we know that organic signatures underpin the very basis of how we look for life um, throughout the solar system. Um, but the types of organics that I'm really interested in are the ones that are very hard to interpret, but very easy to preserve through time. So compounds like DNA and RNA don't have uh, great preservation potential when it comes to thinking about the Precambrian, um, and neither do structural preferences in organic molecules. Pigments do tend to preserve a lot better than um, those first two things, but they still don't preserve uh, all the way back through time to, to the Archean. When we start to get to things like hopanes, which are lipid biomarkers, a hopane is the geologic version of a hopanol, which comes from a bacterial cell membrane. It loses its OH groups and functionality and it becomes a stable geological molecule called a hopane, which can survive uh, for a long time in deep time. So the oldest generally accepted uh, hopanes in the geologic record are about 1.64 billion years old, and they come from the Barney Creek Formation in Western Australia. Another example of compounds that preserve through deep time are some complex organics like polyaromatic hydrocarbons. So these are aromatic hydrocarbons with multiple rings, and they tend to preserve quite well through deep time, and they tend to be produced um, through not only through one of the methods they tend to be produced by is heat generation, which we have a lot of in the geologic record when we are metamorphosing rocks. So there are three main problems when it comes to the reliability of organic biosignatures in deep time. They are uh, preservation, the uh, compounds that give the most information about, a, about an organism don't preserve very well. And the ones that do preserve very well are far more ambiguous, which brings us into our second point, compound ambiguity. So when we do find a compound, we have to work out where it came from, and that can be incredibly difficult. The third point uh, is contamination. Contamination in the early Earth record is huge, and it's a pervasive problem. And there are a lot of different methods that we employ on the early Earth to try to untangle what might be real from what's a later source of contamination. So Archean rocks, so these are rocks in the very early Earth, have formed the basis for how we look for life on Mars, um, given their similar age. So we have here on the left, this is uh, boxes when Mars was potentially habitable. Here on the right uh, are some sites from the Pilbara uh, that I particularly like, that I'll probably focus on today, well, that I will focus on today. Um, and you can see that they have similar ages. Um, up here, you can see stromatolites, which are layered accretionary um, biofabrics that show the interaction of bacteria and um, sediment and they build these structures where the shape of the structure is primarily controlled by the type of environment that the stromatolite was being built in. Um, and here on the right you can see uh, a picture from the Pilbara Creighton in Western Australia, the, one of the places that hosts these Archean records of life. And um, this picture is from in 2019 when teams from the Perseverance rover and the ExoMars rover came out to Australia uh, and they were thinking about where they would search for life in these ancient rocks as guides for where they look for life in Mars um, and how difficult it is to find life in these ancient rocks. So early life on Earth is uh, dominantly found in hydrothermal environments. This is a table from Zepeda et al. 2023 
which is not exhaustive, but gives a really good spread of the different kinds of hydrothermal environments um, throughout the Archean that are also associated with life. And you can see that several of these um, different units have organic matter in the form of kerogen or carbonaceous matter. Um, and there's also in this table quite a few points that are arguments or points of debate, arguments against biogenicity of fossils, arguments against biogenicity of stromatolites, which just goes to how difficult it is to actually establish something as life um, in the early Earth. So the dresser formation is one of the examples of uh, early life preservation, and I've just used it because it preserves different types of hydrothermal hydrothermalism. Um, so here at the bottom, this is showing hydrothermal chert veins from a marine setting. So right where these ridges are, this is chert, which is a silica rich rock uh, and barite actually in this case. And this is forming from hydrothermal fluids. And you can see that it's much harder than the rocks that surround it, which is why they've all been weathered away, but the chert veins remain, uh, which is really good when you're trying to look for a sign of life in deep time. You want it to be preserved in a rock that's very durable. Um, so here, this is the map of uh, the North Pole Dome where the dresser formation sits. And these black lines here are the chert veins that zigzag all the way through uh, the dresser. The dresser formation, in addition to preserving these deep ocean hydrothermal environments, has uh, land-based hydrothermal environments in the form of hot springs, which is very rare to be preserved in the geological record, particularly this far back. And uh, the evidence for this is in the form of geyserite, which is this mineral up here, uh, which is only formed from the splashing of a geyser in a land-based hot spring. So even in the early Earth, there are a variety of hydrothermal environments they host life, they host many examples of life. And so when we're trying to learn more about life from the early record, we tend to look at hydrothermal environments throughout Earth's history and use that to extrapolate back to the early Earth. So hydrothermal systems are dynamic and they are transient. Uh, they're not stable systems. There's a lot of change in them and there's a lot of change over what we would consider to be very small spatial scales. So this is a model of a hydrothermal system in um, New Zealand. And you can see here, this is some upflow from fluid. And then the fluid would come out here where it would be between 100 to 120 degrees Celsius. And it would travel through the proximal zone of the hot spring through the middle out to the distal where the temperature of the fluid would then be about ambient, about 25 degrees Celsius. So there's rapid cooling occurring over small scales. The important thing to think about with hydrothermal environments is it's not just what we're seeing above the surface, but below the surface as well. We have these deep reservoirs of heat and fluid that are traveling up through bedrock and then uh, coming up to the surface. And while they're traveling through that bedrock, there is potential for them to pick up organic matter from the rocks that are buried underneath the surface, bring that up and entrap it in the hydrothermal environment we're trying to study contaminating those environments in the field before we've even gotten the samples. So when we're looking for the kinds of compounds that might preserve um, in deep time, in a hydrothermal environment where there's lots of heat, there are certain compounds that are very informative for biology, like uh, crinarchial, for instance, which is a biomarker for archaea. And there are certain compounds which are less informative, but more stable, like phytane, for instance, which comes from the, slide, the side chain of um, chlorophyll. And so phytane has a much higher preservation potential than something like crinarchial um, because it doesn't have these functional groups and heteroatoms, and it's much more simple and stable for deep time. So when it comes to looking at these organic signatures, when the organic matter is left behind by an organism, it's uh, got a lot of functionality, it's got a lot of information, and then over time it uh, succumbs to temperature and pressure from being buried and metamorphosed, and then it starts to lose this information. It loses its heteroatoms, it loses its groups, it even loses the aliphatic chains, and it starts to become increasingly aromatized until you just get these sheets of aromatic rings um, after high temperature and pressure. And so when you're at these areas that have less, more, less metamorphosis, 
there is a higher potential to understand what left them behind. And when you're in an area that's highly metamorphosed, like these ancient rocks, you are finding out less and less information about the biological organisms. And this um, effect is exaggerated in hydrothermal, sit hydrothermal settings, sorry, because there's so much heat that's going on while the system is active. You know, I said in the land-based system at the geyser, it might be like 110, 120 degrees Celsius. But in the deep ocean, when you get to these black smoker systems, they're uh, spewing out fluids that can be over 300 degrees Celsius. So that's already creating a lot of pressure and destruction of a lot of the organic matter that you might have in these environments. So the organic record of... Um, deep time is plagued by uh, false positives and false negatives. And um, one of the most famous examples is this paper by Broxital from uh, the late 90s, where they were looking at uh, signs of life in Archean rocks. And they found the presence of um, hopanes, methyl hopanes, and also stearines. So methyl hopanes were thought at the time to be biomarkers for cyanobacteria and sterines are biomarkers for eukaryotes. So because these types of biosignatures were found in these rocks, it was thought that there was an early rise of eukaryotes during the Archean for a long time. Um, but Brox uh, was suspicious of this, and so he spent uh, almost a decade trying to rectify this because it wasn't consistent with what he thought uh, would be in the geological record. So about 10 years later, Rasmussen et al. Uh, released this paper reassessing the first appearance of eukaryotes and cyanobacteria. And they found that the carbon isotopes in the kerogen and the free fraction of the organic matter were not consistent. And the reports that were originally uh, reported were likely contamination. So then over the next seven years, there was an increase in uh, studies to improve the way that we just track contamination in the lab when it comes to biosignatures and to improve the methodologies. And then in 2015, this paper by Kate French et al came out uh, where they undertook a clean drilling project in the Pilbara. Um, then they separated the drill core into duplicates and they sent it to multiple labs where they worked them up in parallel so that they could be sure that what they found was real and syngenetic and not simply an artifact of contamination in the laboratory. And this uh, process has changed the way that we look at organics in the early earth record and has increased our knowledge about when something is syngenetic to the host rock or not. So one of the ways that we think about uh, whether an organic organic matter is really from the time that the rock was deposited or if it's later contamination is to do with the preservation state of the organic matter. So what I'm showing here is Raman spectra, which are from hydrothermal cherts in uh, the Dresser Formation and also from pyritic stromatolites in the Dresser Formation. And you can see here that there's a D band and a G band. The D is the disordered carbon and the G is the graphitic carbon. And these peaks change their ratios to one another dependent on what temperature they've been heated to over time. And so although it looks like there are two peaks, there are actually about five peaks that are just masquerading as two. And so we have to deconvolute these peaks and then we can ratio them to one another and use geothermometry to assess whether our organic matter is the same temperature we would expect it to be in the rocks that we found it in. So both of these um, studies found that the organic matter was heated to about 300 degrees in these rocks from the Pilbara Craton, and that was in line with what was expected. So they were fairly confident that the um, organics they were looking at were real and not an artifact of later contamination. This is also some further work uh, from chert veins in the dresser formation. You can see here these are GCMS uh, data showing and alkanes, the straight chain alkanes. Um, and we've got uh, this C12 or C11 to C22 here. And um, in between C18 and 19, there's a huge drop off. And so uh, Jan Peter Duda et al uh, looked through the, the records of other types of organisms that might have this drop off, and they found that there were some um, bacteria that also had this drop off. 
And then they also compared this signal uh, to Fischer Tropf products, so abiotic organics that weren't produced by biology, and found that it had a very dissimilar structure. So they were trying to assess the source that left behind this signal without having a clear cut biomarker that they could look at and just say that, hey, this is this kind of organic. So we can see that the organics that have been preserved here from deep time, from the dresser formation, um, include straight chain alkanes, they include some polyaromatic molecules, um, and that there's probably some um, methyl alkanes in there as well. So from this study, uh, Jan Peter Duder et al. Uh, hypothesized that there was a hydrothermal pump effect where bacteria were falling on the seafloor, they were being recycled through the subsurface and coming up through hydrothermal fluid and then being recorded um, in those chert veins. And this was also supported by the study of Baumgartner et al. in 2023, where they looked at some slightly younger rocks that were 3.2 billion years old from sulfur springs and looked at these micro hydrothermal chimneys and found that they were able to trace the temperature evolution of the hydrothermal vent based on the minerals that were precipitated and the organic matter that was preserved within those minerals. And so they also saw that this effect, which um, is coined the hydro hydrothermal pump hypothesis. And we see this all over the modern geological record as well. So I looked at some modern examples of uh, analogs to these ancient rocks. And so this is one of the studies that I did uh, from 2020, which looked at uh, hot springs from El Tadio as analogs to the Dresser Formation and to Mars. And we took some uh, samples, which we thought were microbially, microbially influenced, and we ran them through a GCMS. And we found these kinds of compounds that have high preservation potential, telling us about the information that we might be able to see in deeper time. And so what we were able to see were biomarkers for cyanobacteria. Um, and we found them in the form of monomethyl heptadecanes. So C17 with a methyl group in the middle, that's a signal that we only see from different types of cyanobacterial closely related bacteria. And that's something that has high preservation potential through deep time. Uh, we also looked in the Taupo volcanic zone in New Zealand, and we found um, through looking at the aromatic molecules, so phenanthrene and its methyl phenanthrene derivatives and naphthalene and the methyl and dimethyl and trimethyl naphthalenes, we can look at the ratio of the methyl groups to the parent molecule and we can know how hot the organic matter has been heated to based on the relative stability of the different me methyl groups. And this is really well calibrated because this is something that petroleum geologists use a lot to understand the source matter of their oils. And so we uh, used these calibrations to understand more about the organic matter we were finding in the Taupo volcanic zone. And we found it in a hot spring in about the mid apron and this is an area where it shouldn't get hotter than about 65 to 45 degrees Celsius. But the signal that we were getting here was telling us the organic matter had been heated to above 100 degrees to 120 degrees or so. So we were able to, along with other evidence in the paper, interpret that this wasn't organic matter that was coming from in situ, uh, the conical tufted mats that we were finding in the hydrothermal environment, but actually it was probably organic matter that had come up from the subsurface, been brought up and then entrained throughout the hot spring. And so through that knowledge of the context of the specific environment we were looking at, we were able to interpret the in field based contamination. Uh, we also looked at hydrothermal environments in Yellowstone. And so these are some fossilized uh, hydrothermal environments that I was looking at. Um, there's a sample called Biffy, which is a banded iron formation, um, which is like a miniature little stromatolite with banded iron formations, which is like one of my favorite samples I've ever looked at. This is steep cone. Um, we took a transect through steep cone um, to look at how the organics changed throughout steep cone. And then we also had this area where there were stromatolites in a, a rim of an extinct hot spring pool. And what we found again were these uh, methyl groups is methyl heptadecanes, um, which are able to be preserved through deep time. And we uh, related them to some research that had been done to look at the GCMS spectra of Synococcus chloroflexi and found that they had a very similar distribution. So we we're pretty confident that Synococcus chloroflexi 
could be something that was preserved within these these samples. So we started using these modern hydrothermal examples to understand what was going on in deep time because a lot of the studies that look at modern hot springs uh, focus on the polar compounds which don't have good preservation through time they're extremely informational to tell you a lot about the kinds of organisms that are in those hot springs but because they don't preserve well they're not giving us a good inventory for what we might be able to find later later on um, so we have to think when we're looking at these environments about site specific alteration processes, as well as processes that we know from across the sedimentary record. And without assessing the context of the formation of the environment we're looking at and the diagenetic processes that could occur in that specific environment, we can't accurately evaluate the biogenicity and syngeneity of more ambiguous compounds that don't outright tell us whether they were produced by biology or not. So when we're looking at organic matter in deep time, we really have to thoroughly consider what mineral is it being preserved in, what kind of environment is it being preserved in, what happened to it uh, while during the whole time it's being preserved, and really use all of those questions to start to build up the picture of, of what we're looking at. Um, so I'd just like to acknowledge that a lot of this work was done when I was in Australia. Um, and the Australian Centre for Astrobiology, but I continue to work on deep time and think about deep time now that I'm here in the Origins and Habitability Laboratory at JPL. Um, and if anyone's interested in more of the kind of work that I was talking about today, uh, you can find it in these papers. And thank you for listening. Great. Uh, thank you, Bonnie. And uh... With that, um, we've had both speakers go. So now we're open to discussions. And so if anyone has any questions for either speaker, you can type them into the chat. Or if you prefer, you can also um, use one of the Zoom features to raise your hand and we can ask you to unmute um, to directly ask your question. Um, and I guess to start off, I had a question for Patrick. And so you had that measurement of this negative delta 15 N, um, uh, in this sample. And are there other processes that are going to produce these negative, uh, delta 15 N besides the process you were, um, looking at? And is there a way to distinguish between those processes? You mean if other processes are like having a similar signature as lightning? Um, yes, yeah. Um, I mean, there, there are a few different um, processes that produce like values for the whole range of um, between minus 15 or even lower and then zero like different types of nitrogen oxide production. Um, like, for example, uh, um, what was it? Um, like um, diesel engines and like loads of processes. Obviously now we look, when we're looking back on the early earth, there won't be, won't have been any diesel engines or okay. stuff, um, but any process that produces NOx, like they're, they're all sort of, um, scattered around there. So there could be other, maybe other processes, but I don't know exactly what um, that'd be. Okay. So then you think that this uh, data point with the negative delta 15N is pretty, uh, you would say definitively due to lightning or that's- No, I, I wouldn't say, as a, especially as this, data point had a quite a big uncertainty. So it could have also been at the upper end, more like minus two or even zero. Um, um, so we were always going in into this, knowing that if, should our lightning signature correspond to the um, rock record nitrogen signatures, that would, could mean that lightning is a source, but it would not, be a proof that it is the source. 
it's just like now that they are different, the signatures that we can say lightning is not the source. Okay. And so there's a question in the chat for Bonnie from uh, William. And it says, what do you consider the oldest valid dates for bacterial and eukaryotic biomarkers? Mm, I guess it's less important what I consider the oldest valid dates for them as, as what is generally accepted by um, organic geochemists. So the Oldest generally accepted hopanes, so bacterial uh, biomarkers, are, as I said before, 1.64 billion years old from the Barney Creek Formation in Western Australia. And that's uh, got some pretty good um, preservation and hasn't been as highly metamorphosed as other areas um, around there. And then when it comes to sterains, that's kind of, so sterains is in uh, the biomarkers for eukaryotes, that's kind of more up for debate. Um, there are some people that say that the sterine biomarkers is as old as 1.8 GA, a uh, billion years ago, sorry. Um, but less people, I think, would say that's generally accepted. Um, there's been a lot of work by Jochen Brox et al. Um, uh, over the past few years, really reorganizing and cleaning up the sterine papers, because there are a lot of papers reporting sterines from the early geologic record that were later contamination. And of course, those papers remain in the literature. And so it's hard to, to know when you're starting to read the literature. Um, but any of the papers from 2017, like Brock's et al. 2017, looking at the record of uh, eukaryotic algae and the ratio of red green algae, that shows very nicely the, the record of sterines when they were found and how they changed over time to show the, the changes between green and red algae over, over that time period. Great. So there was another question in the chat for Bonnie and it is, do you think that we will be able to detect some biosignatures on Jupiter's or Saturn's icy moons? And if yes, which ones? Oh, yeah, I hope so, because that's what my post was on. Um, <laughs> that would be very nice for me, if so. Um, so, you know, uh, Saturn and Jupiter's moons, uh, Enceladus and Europa, are both thought to contain hydrothermal environments. Enceladus has more definitive evidence than Europa in the form of hydrothermal environments that are gushing out into space, leaving behind Saturn's E ring. Um, and it's thought that. The Enceladus' hydrothermal environments would be produced from a serpentinizing system in a more alkaline environment, whereas Europa, if it does contain hydrothermal systems, it would more likely be acidic uh, hydrothermal systems. And so the key part there is that uh, typically these serpentinizing systems, they produce um, less heat than the black smokers. So if it's serpentinizing system, it might be closer to 70 to 100 degrees Celsius, whether a system, where a system like a black smoker system is going to be above 300 degrees Celsius. And so those serpentinizing systems are much more uh, appealing for life. They're much easier for life and organic matter to survive. Um, so I think that looking in either environment, depending on where you're looking at, is a great place to start because we know that they're so preserved uh, very well in early Earth. Um, and I think whether we're able to detect the biosignatures versus whether they are there may be two separate questions. Because if we're thinking about um, Enceladus or Europa, these are icy moons with giant ice caps. And then you've got the hydrothermal environments down and the ocean floor. Um, and it's hard for us to find hydrothermal environments in our own planet, uh, let alone uh, at, at the ocean floor, let alone on another planetary body like these, these icy moons. And so I think it would be challenging to find the kinds of biomarkers that I'm talking about. Um, but it's definitely like a challenge that we should take up. I think that would be very exciting. Um, so I think the largest obstacles there are getting below the ice and trying to, to get something in there to be able to search in situ for those signatures. Great. 
Great, thanks. And I did see that Kevin Devine uh, might have a question. And let me try to ask you to unmute to see if you're able to. Okay, can you hear me okay? Yes. yes. Question for Bonnie, by the way. Pa thank you, Patrick. It was very, very interesting talking kind of about how we could use sort of N15, N14 sort of isotope ratios as a looking for potential biological sources of nitrates and other nitrogen oxides on Mars. That was very interesting indeed. My question for Bonnie is, what solvent systems do you use to extract your hydrocarbon biosignatures from the, ver the various rocks? I presume you're looking for lipophilic solvents like dichloromethane, toluene, et cetera. What, what, was your what was the best solvent or solvent system for extracting these particular hydrocarbon biomarkers? Yeah, I used a combination of dichloromethane, methanol, and hexane, depending on what I was trying to extract. Um, and so I would typically do the first extraction uh, via sonication because I didn't want to use any equipment that anybody else was using because I had to make sure my stuff didn't get contaminated. So I had my own like glassware separate that I had to clean and it went through a very rigorous process that went for days. And you, keep, um, you bake it at very high temperatures to make sure there's no residual organics of any kind there. That's right. That's <laughs> right. Yeah. So I had a cleaning process before that and then I would furnace them and they would be in the furnace over 500 degrees for more than 12 hours. I would also furnace my aluminium foils in like so that nothing was uh, contaminating them. Um, but using sonication isn't necessarily the most efficient extraction technique. So I may have lost some stuff there, but thought it was better to lose some stuff than um, get <clears throat> contamination. Uh, so I would start with the dichloromethane and um, methanol mixture for the extractions. And then I would also do hexane. Um, and then I would extract the whole total lipid extract. And then I would do column fractionation to separate out the aliphatics, the aromatics, and the polar compounds as well, if there were any polar compounds, if I was working on younger stuff. So you don't do heat, you prefer sonication to heat, to heating the, the samples, is that right? Zoom. Yes, Cause that's would right. You, and if you were to heat them, would it make sense to do it under an inert atmosphere rather than under air, of course, for obvious, to prevent risk of premature oxidations? Yes, so I would have to dry out the solvents um, mm -hmm. so that I could get them into a, you know, uh, size for the GCMS. Mm -hmm. And so when I was actually evaporating them, because I couldn't put them um, in the regular system that we, which was like a nitrogen blow down system that everybody else would use, I would actually have the beakers uh, covered in the aluminum foil on a hot plate um, at about like 60 or 70 degrees just to speed that up because it really was like watching paint dry and I couldn't take my eyes mm -hmm. off it for a second because oh, yeah. if it fully mm -hmm. evaporated, I'd, I'd lose the light end. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Very interesting. Thank you. Thank you. So there's a, another question in the chat from Mark, and it is, given that the surface of Mars has been irradiated by UV radiation and cosmic rays over geologically long periods of time, would you expect any organic biomarkers to be preserved on the surface? Yeah, this is a great question. Um, there's also like the highly oxidizing conditions in the regolith, which are pretty destructive, even for polyaromatic hydrocarbons, um, which is a big problem. Um, so one of the things that I think is really important when we think about these organic molecules, like I said, is thinking about site specific processes. So what we know about uh, organics on Earth and how they're altered, we know from geologically active planet from plate tectonics. But those kinds of alteration processes aren't the kinds of alteration processes that would be happening on Mars. And so the way that organics break down under UV radiation, under cosmic rays from oxidants, these are potentially different processes than the ones that we know from the sedimentary record. So we need to start doing a lot more studies. Uh, there are some, there should be a lot more that consider how these processes interact with these kinds of molecules. Uh, there was a study from um, the Spanish Center of Astrobiology, which looked at a transect uh, through El Tadio hot springs and then studied a lot because of the high UV. And it looked at the preservation of fatty acids through that transect. 
And because of the high UV, they weren't preserving very well over like even a time span that we would expect fatty acids to preserve. And I think fatty acids can preserve some of the oldest are in the Cretaceous, um, but these were going far faster than that. So we know that the UV is affecting the molecules a lot faster than we would expect otherwise. So definitely it would be like an exaggerated process. I guess the question is whether you take the samples from the surface or you drill down to underneath where that effect is and then take the samples there as well. How far down do you have to go before you can get an organic molecule that hasn't ha been subject to these pressures? So there's a, another question for Patrick in the chat from AC, and it is, the Archean atmosphere is estimated to have also contained some methane. Have you included this composition in the reactions, and do you think this would have altered the nitrogen isotopes? Um, well, so we did do some experiments with hydrogen, not with methane. Um, with about like 1% hydrogen in the gas mixture. And um, the idea was if, um, so like if you have some hydrogen in the atmosphere or in the gas mixture, you might produce more ammonia and subsequent ammonium. Um, and, uh, and that might then change the isotomic composition of all the nitrogen that is in your um, aqueous phase. But as soon as you have only a few percent of CO2 in your gas mixture, or even just some water vapor, um, there's so much oxygen there that you will produce much more nitrogen oxides than ammonia. So even though we didn't measure the isotopic composition of those products in the end, I wouldn't expect um, them to change. I hope that answers the question. Thanks. And so there is um, one question for Bonnie from John, and it is, from your extensive research, which possible organics on present-day Mars might represent early Mars biomolecules? None. Um, <laughs> so none of the organics that have been detected so far on Mars are um, definitively biomolecules. There was actually a press release that came out after the thiophene detection. They were trying to compare, the, the journalist was comparing it to compounds that were found in like pigs or pig styes or something. And it was really misleading. You know, it's very often that these um, journal uh, popular media publications are very misleading about like whether we've detected life or signs of life. And I still remember being annoyed about that years later. Um, so one of the great things I think about the organics on Mars is that they've been regarded with great scrutiny and there's been a lot of um, research into what they possibly could be, when they could have formed, because even the organics that are being detected now, like are they something that's been there even from like an early Mars molecule that's not biotic, but that did come from early Mars, or is it coming from something later? Especially as we were just talking about, there's a lot of processes going on in the Martian regolith. There's oxidation states, there's a lot of like uh, chemical change. Uh, there was even the detection of the chlorobenzenes. Like when, when did that become chlorinated? And Mark Sefton's group out of Imperial had some great papers as, uh, doing laboratory studies to, to model that. Um, so definitely nothing that's being detected now would represent a biomolecule. I think it's most likely that a lot of these organics are from meteoric, meteoric input, um, as has been suggested from some of the literature. Um, and then we haven't got close to detecting anything that would be regarded as anything close to definitively biotic. I think everybody's pretty firmly in the abiotic provenance camp for, for everything that's been detected so far, which is why we need to do a lot of research on these kinds of suspicious, suspicious compounds where you can't tell whether they were biotic or not so that we can continue to improve our understanding so we don't accidentally interpret something incorrectly. Great. I think uh, I just saw um, 
Mark raised his hand, so I think you should be able to unmute. Okay, yes, I'd like to just follow up on an earlier question I had then about uh, the Mars preservation of surface biosignatures. How is this going to affect uh, the return samples that the Perseverance rover was collecting over the last couple of years on the on the surface? I, I know, I think they, did they drill down deep enough to where there would be preservation of any biomarkers or are we almost maybe possibly wasting our time <laughs> returning these samples only to be, you know, you know, from the sur near surface only to not really provide a lot of useful information. I would say, first of all, regardless of whether there are organic biosignatures preserved in these samples that will come back from Mars or not, there definitely won't be a waste of time. Um, we'll be able to get uh, dates for a lot of the rocks that we've never been able to get information for. There's a lot of information that we're going to be able to get about the samples in general, regardless of the organics that are going to dr drastically improve our understanding of, of Mars as a whole. Um, the other thing is that we know even on the surface or when they're doing abrasions that they have been able to detect organic molecules. Sherlock has detected abundant, well, not abundant because it's Mars, but, you know, Sherlock's detected a lot of aromatic molecules. Um, and and uh, Sam on Curiosity has also detected uh, quite some different types of primarily aromatic molecules as well. So we're still getting information about the history of Mars and we're understanding where the organics are being preserved and what minerals they have a relationship to and what parts of Mars's history they have a relationship to. Uh, the, the samples that are being taken are being drilled down. So it's not just like the very surface that's oh. uh, being taken. Um, so the sample tubes, there's like a, a drilling process and then that gets deposited into the sample tubes themselves where it's housed and, and, and protected in the sample tubes. Have they done like in the lab, have, how do you know how deep you would have to drill though to not be affected by like the oxidation or radiation? Have they studied that in the lab or with Martian stimulants or, I mean, has anybody bombarded using an electron gun? <laughs> synchrotron you know uh simulated martian soil to do studies like that i mean how would you have to go down a meter or just only a few centimeters uh from what i know it's a few centimeters but i haven't directly worked on that problem so i wouldn't quote me oh um definitely right, right. yeah yeah um but definitely the people have thought about this but uh, and had discussions about how many centimeters you would have to go for the samples to be protect, uh, protected. Um, but there should be a lot more research into this, in my opinion. I think that it's a very exciting avenue uh, for our understanding of these kinds of biosignatures, understanding more what UV and uh, other forms of radiation or alteration will do to these organic molecules, particularly oxidation as well. Yes, thanks. Thank you. Okay, um, so I see that Kevin's hand is raised. Is that from before or do you have an, another yeah, question? Yes, indeed. No, it's a, another follow-up what you said about potential biosignatures. There is the detection through the derivatization experiment of benzoic acid with elevated levels of the, the, the carbon-12, the lighter isotope, which is what you'd expect if the origin is biogenic rather than abiotic. So... I think is that the only one that's the only as far as I know molecule on Mars that's been detected that shows this disparity when you compare that to the C12 C13 ratios in the CO2 atmosphere you know what what do you say about that Bonnie have you you familiar with that story and also if I could mention the chlorobenzene that was detected in the initial GCMS studies on on the sat on this the sample analysis at Mars on Curiosity, that almost certainly arises from alteration by chlorine gas resulting from perchlorate breakdown at three hundred degrees centigrade of benzoic acid. Yes, so Mark Sefton's um, group when they were 
modeling um, that in the laboratory also looked into like when that chlorination um, may have occurred and came to a very similar conclusion. Uh, when you're talking about the derivatization COP experiment, are you talking about Maiva Milan's paper? Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. from, yeah. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, I know the paper, but I'm not a carbon isotope uh, person, so I can't really speak to the carbon isotope uh, portion of that. Um, so I don't think I would be able to give an accurate enough answer uh, to respond to your question. Yes, it's, it's, a pity, it's a pity. It depends on it. It could be, but it's, a, it's rather a boring organic molecule in some respects. So, you know, if it was something else, if it was a fatty acid or if it was uh, um, a preferably an amino acid, then I think I'd be a lot more excited, certainly. But but it's still intriguing, nonetheless. It's intriguing, you know. And about the the methane, as I say, was a, there's a question about the methane, the Martian methane, which they've certainly seen these elevated um, fluctuations of methane and oxygen at Gale Crater. You know, the 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 tunable laser spectrometer on Curiosity has detected this, you know, season after season. So. This is indeed intriguing, but the Mars Express in orbit, I don't think, could pick it up because I think it's a very localized effect. So that's very intriguing. So what's, what's your view on the Martian methane, anyway? Um, I've read the same thing as you, that there's been the localized um, detections, but they haven't been able to detect it from orbit. Um, but again, I, I don't work on microbial production of methane, so I wouldn't feel comfortable commenting on that in this kind of forum. Okay, I think with that, I kind of went through the questions. Um, uh, or a couple things popped up, but uh, let's see. Someone asked if you could comment on your 2020 publication in AstroBio. That seems like quite a broad um, question. So I'm not sure if you want to take a stab at that but I think if you're very uh interested you that might be more suited to a perhaps email discussion or something um, of the sort so maybe if you wanted to put your uh email in the chat if you're comfortable with that that might be helpful and um okay yeah so she just put her paper there um and I think Kevin had some comments on the uh, isotope variation of methanes. Um, so that's, looks like that was covered. And I know that it is very late for uh, Patrick over in Germany. So I think with that, maybe we can end the uh, session here. And thank you to both of the speakers again for taking the time to uh, share your work with us. It was very I think everyone enjoyed it. And um, yeah, I think this is the last session of the PCE3 seminar for this year. And I think we're planning to start it up again sometime next year. And so we'll keep you all posted. And uh, thank you all for joining us. And thank you again to our speakers. Thank you. Thank you.